When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme. But at length reflection came to my aid. The cat I remembered had been hung in the garden, adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd, by some of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree, and thrown through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, had then accomplished. The portraiture, as I saw it, although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling fact just detailed, it did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months, I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat, and during this period, there came back into my spirit a half sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of an animal, and to look about me among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented, for another pet of the same species and of somewhat similar appearance, with which to supply its place. One night, as I sat, half stupefied in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin and of rum. Which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had not sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and. Closely resembling him in every respect but one, Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white, covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted at my attention. This then was the very creature of which I was in search. I at last offered to purchase it from the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caresses, and when I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my own part, I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated, but I know not how or why it was. Its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed me. By slow degrees. These feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame, and the remembrance of my former dead cat, an act of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not, for some weeks, strike or otherwise violently ill use it. But gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with. Unutterable loathing, and to flee silently from its odious presence, as from the breath of a pestilence. What added, no doubt, to my hatred of the beast, was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that, like Pluto, it also had been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I've already said, possessed in a high degree. That humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait, and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a pertinacity which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. 
Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and thus nearly throw me down, or fastening its long and sharp claws in my dress, clamber in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from doing so partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, by absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of the physical evil, and yet I should be at a loss how otherwise to define it. I am almost ashamed to own, yes, even in this felon cell, I'm almost ashamed to own that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention, more than once, to the character of the mark of white hair, of which I have spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name, and for this, above all, I loathed and dreaded, and would have rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, of the gallows. Oh, mournful and terrible engine of the horror and of crime, of agony and of death. And now was I indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity. And a brute beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, for me a man, fashioned in the image of a high god, so much of insufferable woe, alas, Neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former, the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter, I started hourly from the dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face and its vast weight and incarnate the nightmare that I had no power to shake off, incumbent eternally upon my heart.' 